We've moved beyond that. The focus is on the post-millennial generation, the people who are between the ages of 15 and 25. What's to be done for them? If we look at the unemployment statistics by region, South Africa, as a reflection of Southern Africa, has an unemployment rate that's close on to 29%. And if you look at the unofficial statistics, they tell you it's 40%. Nigeria currently has an unemployment rate of somewhere between 23% and 25%, and it's believed that by next year, it's going to be 30% on the dot. In East Africa, the largest economy, Kenya, has an unemployment rate of just over 11%. So that, as large a figure as it is, is the most encouraging figure there is on the African continent at the moment, in that it's the lowest. And collectively, the countries of North Africa have unemployment at 25%. So if you just look at the averages, in almost every major economy, a quarter of the population are people who cannot find a job. And so what we are going to do this afternoon is move beyond the statistics and ask, how do we remedy the situation? Because the time for talking is over. It is now time to find solutions. So let me introduce you to our panel. We have seated next to me His Excellency, the President of Botswana, President Masisi. Seated next to, her, next to him is Her Excellency, the President of Ethiopia, President Zude. Seated next to her is the Chairman and Founder of Nigeria's largest bank, Zenith Bank, Jim Ovia. Seated next to him is a civil society activist, a former uh, VP for Africa at the World Bank, uh, Mrs. Uh, Obi Ezekwesili. And seated next to her is the uh, Vice President for Global Policy at Google, Karan Bhatia. So let's get talking. President Masisi, let's start with you. Botswana, so many positive indicators, democracy, development, growth, and yet here is a country that's said to have unemployment at 18%. That's a staggering figure for a country with just two million people. Do you agree that for you it's a ticking time bomb? Absolutely. And thanks anyway for your introductory remarks, particularly about mm -hmm. what we see outside and what you as South Africans represent. Um, because um, this could be in any of our countries, yeah. given the situation. But yes, 18% for a country like Botswana is, is a scary figure. And when you unpack it even the more, that um, out of that 18%, the majority are young people, um, fairly well educated, given what we do in Botswana, uh, with a lot of um, expectations for the future. And yet, the burden of frustration of not being able to find jobs uh, could easily be offset and cause such people to venture into other things that may not be as desirable. So yes, it is a ticking time bomb. President Zude from uh, Ethiopia. It's projected that by next year, unemployment in Ethiopia will be 19.4%. Uh, However, Ethiopia has one of the highest and fastest growth rates on the African continent. You've started opening your markets and you've definitely dented poverty. So I'm trying to figure out, everything else seems to be working, but why can you not get a grip on the employment issue? Oh, thank you very much. Let me start by uh, really commending what you said at the beginning. Um, the South Africa we know is not the one we, we see. and. Um, and uh, I would like also um, uh, really people to understand that, uh, you know, um, foreigners who live uh, far away from their homeland contribute to those countries. They are not only burdens. And um, really we sympathize for those who have been suffering under that. And of course, we have all of us uh, condemn 
gender-based violence that uh, we also saw. Definitely, this is not the Africa we want. Uh, as the slogan says, for 2063, we'll have to work all of us together. I agree uh, if uh, this uh, unemployment uh, uh, situation for youth and um, not having a prospect for a better future can be a ticking bomb, that's uh, for sure. Uh, I must say that Ethiopia has embarked into a very transformative and inclusive process for only 12 months now, a little bit more than that. Uh, and um, many things have been, uh, are being done in order to address this uh, very important issue. And, um, and I think it's a, it's a conversation uh, which is very pertinent at the continental level. Uh, we are trying to address, for instance, uh, the Prime Minister has uh, uh, embarked into a plan uh, to have three million new jobs for the next year. We're starting a new year next week. And um, that is in order to make sure that those who benefit from the policies and commitments made by the government could also contribute in, in hiring uh, young people. So uh, I think it's a transition. Uh, we believe we are in the right path, but this is a very pertinent issue really to address. Jim Ovia, let's get a perspective from you as a representative of the private sector. So you founded Nigeria's largest bank by market capitalization and assets, and you are employing a lot of people, but you are employing the high-skilled girls and boys, the people who come with tech, with finance, with MBAs. What do you make of the ones at the bottom of the pyramid, the people who are desperate for jobs but would never be able to work in your bank? Thank you. The bottom of the pyramid, the youths, the unemployed, and those who have great energy, those who have the potential to be trained, and also those who embrace digital technology. The beauty of having a young African population, which by your statistics, 250 million, I just finished a session where we're discussing the Africa uh, growth plan. And the focus was principally, how do we empower the youths? How do we create jobs for the youth? That was the focus. As chairperson of World Economic Forum, Africa Regional Conference, since last year, 2008, that's exactly what we've been focusing on. The figure we had was slightly over 400 million youths that would be looking for jobs that needed to be empowered. And interestingly, we found out that they are all very willing, very capable, very able to embrace <coughs> digital technology. Because in millennials, that's the direction of growth. That's the room for growth. They are not necessarily interested in brick and mortar transactions as it used to be several years ago. And right here, I'm very proud to say that a number of African youths, particularly Nigeria, South Africa, and to some extent, Kenya, they have gone beyond the shores of Africa to places like Silicon Valley in California to raise funding from venture capital, to raise funding from funds managers for their startup businesses. And the most impressive thing here, why I'm so proud, is these are very young entrepreneurs under the age of 30. Really, the target numbers that you are making reference to, that they are unemployed, they don't have skills. But let's look at it the other way around. Let's reverse the role. They are now going outside the shores of Africa, and they are being well received by the venture capitalists and front managers in Silicon Valley to raise sizable amount of money. We're talking about millions of dollars. The most impressive thing are issue of corporate governance. 
and they've been able to achieve that issue of rule of law, they also have been able to respect and recognize contract, contractual obligations, they're able to honor them. And this has started happening just less than five, six years ago. We have such names, I will mention them here, that have gone global, Flutter Wave, a payment system, uh, Paystack, a payment system, and apt technology, a payment system. And you'll be very impressed the recognition that these youth, these young entrepreneurs. Okay. And our focus for Africa plan platform opportunity for growth, growth platform, is that we should be targeting about 400 million new startup companies in the area of SME, small, medium scale enterprises, in the next five years. All right. If we achieve that target, this unemployment we're talking about, that we are all scared it's going to be a time board, we should reverse that narrative. Thank you. We'll talk about the solutions in a second, Jim Ovia. Obese Kwesili, please, can I get your perspective? I think one of the things I didn't tell the audience, not that you need any introduction, is that you're also the forthright, foremost campaigner for the Bring Back Our Girls campaign. So if there's anybody who really knows what young people are feeling on the ground, it's you. Can you tell us about the sentiment on the ground? Thank you very much, Loretta. Um, I think that the first thing to do is to acknowledge uh, what you started off with um, about South Africa and what we've seen on the streets. I think that there has to be a, 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 a very uh, distinct session for us to discuss the issues of our collaboration as Africans. The reality of what we saw in South Africa is too sordid for it to be a mere conversation, by the way. This is the issue. We cannot have um, Africa Continental Free Trade Agreement, and yet we have a situation where there's black on black violence in this country. So I do hope that we're going to go beyond the marginal conversations of it and get to the heart of the matter of what kind of integrated Africa we want to drive forward. So that's number one. Number two is uh, to, to the issue that uh, we, we've come to discuss about promising the future. What does the future look like as we see it going forward? The future is the fourth industrial revolution and that which will come immediately after it. So we're talking of an Africa and young people who are going to be thrown and in fact already thrown into a future that's made up of the AIs of this world, artificial intelligence, the robotics, internet of things, they are in the world and ecosystem where it is about blockchain technologies and all the machine learning and the algorithms and things that are totally way off the kind of education that we are offering them. So we are talking about a pool of people. You said 12 million do enter the labor market every year. I need you to know that only 10% of the 12 million would find anything that is defined as decent jobs, according to ILO. Now, if only 10% would find those jobs, and we've got this 90% that are on the margins of society, that is the issue of governance for us. We must look at the, the failure of governance to actually in, in, have the right kinds of policies that lead to growth. The growth that is diversified, the growth that is inclusive. And at the heart of this is what kind of education system, what kind of skills are we emphasizing, what kind of economic opportunities. You know, the great issue for us is that we have seen that if a sector actually gets the right kinds of policies, telecommunication, it changes slightly the structure of the African economy. We have understood that. So what is it about our wacky politics on this continent that's making us have people who are comfortable enough to watch the growth of the number of people that are on the margins of economic possibilities? That's the conversation. And I think that at the heart of it is that politics trumps economy on our continent, and that's a dangerous thing. So I'd like you to just spell it out very briefly. 
Are you saying that our politicians are counterproductive? Our politicians need to be put in a room and told that they have produced a miserable situation that is not worthy of the young people that hold them responsible for their fate. It is not a good thing, and I believe that the conversation about our politics has to be a conversation around the quality of politics that we play on our continent. Thank you very much. Mr. Bhatia, over to you. Obi brought us now into the fourth industrial revolution. It is here. The economies are digitizing. It is happening. But the pool of skills doesn't match what's happening in industry and in commerce. How can you help Google? So, first of all, I, I think to the question of is it a ticking time bomb, uh, the answer is yes, possibly. But it could also be an unbelievable source of, of growth uh, in the continent, the youthful population here. Uh, it is sort of your glass half full, glass half empty occasion. When I look at the continent, we see enormous opportunities if the right set of policies ultimately is adopted. But before I come to that, let me just say, I think technology, it won't surprise you that I'm going to be an evangelist for technology as being the solution to this challenge. And in many ways, when you think about what it provides that is unique from almost any other sector, it is a leveling, it is an equality. The, the, the poor rural youth here has to the extent they can actually gain access to the internet, and we'll come back to that, but that individual has access to the exact same search engine when he goes to google.com, the exact same Gmail, the exact same Android phone system as does a rich person halfway around the world. So at its very essence, the technology is leveling. Now, how do we enable that poor rural youth to get there? I would suggest four things we should be thinking about. One is access. The reality is that Africa today is trailing badly in terms of internet accessibility, 35% yes. as opposed to well above 50 in, in the Asia Pacific region and not to mention much higher numbers elsewhere. So that's one. Now the responsibility for that falls on the private sector and the government working together. We can do a better job building the kinds of products that are enabling that kind of access, but we need government to work by correcting the market, investing in the right things and so forth. The second is a digital culture. We need to build into the mindset of everything, of every actor in government, of every actor in the private sector. How do we build digital into the solutions? Mm -hmm. The third is skilling. We talked about that, I think, Obi and Jim and others. It's an area where we feel passionately about. I was last yesterday with a group of, of 10, 11, 12-year-olds here in a township. The talent, the passion, the skill, it's there. We just need to be able to create the mechanisms. And then lastly, I would say regulation is important, regulation and policy. I just want to stay with you, Karen, very briefly. I remember speaking to a CEO of an African multinational in the telecommunication space, and they said the reality on the ground in Africa right now, 30% of the population is living in the 4G world. Mm. Everybody else is in the 2G world. They know what's available to them. They can't afford it, exactly. they can't access it, and so actually technology is not a leveler. And not only are they living in the 2G world, they're living in a 2G world at prices that are many times what one would be mm. paying in the developed markets. Mm -hmm. It's not fair, and it is an enormous disabler of growth, but it is fixable with the right set of investments and the right set of policies. How can it be fixed? I mean, I know that you've looked at things like free internet, but when you're speaking to policymakers on the African continent, how do you say to them, technology is the lever that changes the economy, and this is how to roll it out? So I, I just purely on the access side, I think it is a combination between investing in the fundamental infrastructure, the network infrastructure that still trails, the, and, but at the same stage, marrying that with market reform, the reality is that the African markets in many cases is fragmented. It's, it's terrific to see the free trade agreement coming about, but hopefully that will lead to the kinds of integration that we need. And it, all, it frankly also requires greater competition in some of these markets. Okay. President Masisi, President Zude, I want to bring the comment that was made there. Our politicians, counterproductive, actually creating misery. Does that apply to you? Uh, not to me, but perhaps some others. 
No, on a serious note, I think um, we do need to have a conversation about the kind of politics that we have. A lot of it um, doesn't seem to serve a purpose. And um, much as I do believe technology may have a, well, would have a very big role to play in terms of promoting access and turning around this negative outlook into a promise, the precondition for that to be would be the right policies being in place. And these policies are to correct an otherwise unbalanced world. But, you know, we're talking about Africa. We also are part of a global community, and we subscribe to the Sustainable Development Goals. There is a major responsibility of those who have much more than what Africa has, and most of it accrued from Africa. They have a moral obligation and a responsibility to make sure that we fix the prices. Because if we don't, migration will not stop. Underdevelopment will not stop. Inequality will not stop. Human rights abuses will not stop. And whether you call it xenophobia or black and black crime, will not stop. So it's a much bigger problem than we, we see. And I think, yes, the political leaders will have to get together and, and sort this out. But a compact needs to be gotten into place. What is the primary objective of leadership? This is a leadership test, I think, at this time. I want to stay with you, President Masisi. So we spoke about the unemployment issue in Botswana, problem. Talk to me about the solutions. What are you doing? Well, to a large extent, you know, we in Botswana attempt to resolve our problems by putting together those interventions necessary to migrate as many people as possible to the next level of development. Uh, take ICT in this case. We want to accelerate that for everybody and actually subs sub uh, subsidize for those who can't afford, as we commonly do. We run a social democratic model of government, and so that is doable for us. And that's why we've achieved the levels we have. One of our biggest problems is that we are uh, essentially a single product commodity uh, economy. We are landlocked, and we're fairly small in number. Um, but the bigger challenge is we're in a neighborhood wherein there is very uneven distribution of opportunity, resources, and development. And a lot of it pulls in one direction. Mm. And we have to make assumptions about how we're going to be relating with those. I just think for me, it's really a, an ABC kind of question. Here are these young people, they're looking for jobs. What are the incentives to business to get those people into the workplace? Well, sure, we, provide, we want to provide as many of those incentives as possible. And we've also got to help them deal with the natural challenges they face, such as being landlocked. So what do you do? You open up the skies, you open up the um, you know, telecommunication opportunities, and, uh, and you provide more incentives for them to so do. But more than anything else, you enhance their skill proficiency so that they become much more efficient than anybody else, and therefore competitive. President Zude, what is the case for Ethiopia? Large population, market opening up. What is that promise that's going to be delivered for Ethiopia's young people? Well, I think that um, the future would be promising uh, for Ethiopia. As I have said, um, we, we, we came out from this business as usual. Uh, kind of, uh, of, uh, of uh, development practice that we had in order to have a real transformation which would definitely include the youth and the youth unemployment. So policies and the environment for that are, are, is being crafted. Now, Ethiopia is a late comer in this uh, demographic transition and, and, and so on. We have a huge uh, young population. So. I think we have reached the time, as the scientists say, on, 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 on this democratic dividend, where we have reached the stage where opportunities would be 
you know, um, way, outweigh the, the, the challenges. So this is what we have. Second, um, it's the focus that we are giving to the rural areas of it. 82% of our population lives in the rural area. There is a huge influx into the cities uh, where, uh, you know, uh, we don't have enough services, enough schools, and so on for, for all of them. And we go into that frustration, and it fuels into any kind of other challenges. So this is what we are doing. If I have the floor, let me also say that uh, I think globally, since it is a global uh, problem, we need to go from this kind of conversation in boardrooms to the grassroots. Mm -hmm. We have a huge problem, and I say it forcefully because having been an inter international civil servant, national civil servant, and so on, we have many beautiful productions, beautiful papers on all issues, but we have problems going to the ground. Mm -hmm. So there is a huge mismatch between policies, commitments, and actions on the ground. And I agree with what Obi has said, we have an issue of leadership, governance, and of course, this kind of serious issue can be, can't be used for political expediency. And I also believe that education has a big role right. to play. It's high time globally to re-examine and rethink what education is for the future of, of mankind. Thank you. President Zita, I want to stay with you there. You say we have a future of policy and governance. So we don't get to sit in AU fora. We don't get to sit in those exclusive meetings with fellow heads of state, but you guys do. Do you look your peers in the eye and tell them, you know, this is nonsense. This is rubbish, you could do better. I'm a newcomer in that business. <laughs> <laughs> I've been a backbencher for so long and I have seen what is being done. I can tell you very honestly, we have to change the way we do business. This we have to accept. Uh, I think we have what it takes to change the situation within our countries and beyond, within our continent, but we definitely have to change the way we are addressing serious issues, and especially like this one. Mr. Jim Ove, you've been silent, but let's bring you into the conversation. So I was in Lagos a few weeks ago and I was um, speaking with a leading manufacturer in the country. And one of the things that was said was, um, you know, the market is slowly opening up, but actually it's the banking sector that's absorbing the very best talent in Nigeria. So somebody will come out of university, a mechanical engineer, but will end up working in a bank. Somebody will come out of university with ICT skills and will end up working in the bank. So basically mm -hmm. the banks are mopping up everyone who has talent. And that's because the rest of the economy just doesn't have the capacity to absorb the skills and to churn the skills. When you speak as the business community in Nigeria, how do you think you're gonna go about sorting out these problems? First of all, I think it's a good thing that we have great talents in the bank industry to be able to keep your money for you. <laughs> so now, actually, opportunities are everywhere. It depends on the structure of the economy. And not just the structure of the economy itself, specific industries. If the banking industry decides to structure itself in such a way that it talents, are put out there to manage a huge amount of resources and responsibilities. We can't afford to lose depositors' money. We can't afford to lose money that belongs to stakeholders. So you must structure your industry in such a way that the best are nothing but the best are there. Can you do the same for other industries like telecommunication? The answer is yes. Like power sector. The answer is yes. Like agriculture, the answer is yes. Why is it not done? Government policies. That's exactly what Her Excellency and His Excellency were just alluded to very recently. The government policies anywhere in Africa is exactly what 
has to be changed. The government have to come up with policies that enable other sectors to do well and blossom. If various governments come up with good policy in the area of agriculture, animal husbandries, everyone will want to be in agriculture, want to be a farmer, because it's going to be very profitable. The policy did favor ICT in many countries, like in Nigeria, South Africa, quite a few other countries. And you will see that ICT, the, one of the highest listed uh, market capitalized companies you have in Africa is ICT. So they are doing extremely very well. And that's because the government policy also favors that too. Then what about the area of power sector? Not much had been done in that regard. In many countries, the government also need to come up with enabling policies for power so that there's power everywhere. If you look out, there's darkness in many African countries. Darkness, <laughs> total darkness. Why can't we come up with the right policy, right incentive? Everyone will go into the power sector and brighten up Africa. Just briefly, Nigeria is obviously the largest economy in Africa at the moment. Nigeria has to work. Just as South Africa is the most advanced economy in Africa, it has to work. So when two of the best players are a little bit dysfunctional or underperforming, it's a problem for everybody else. So what pressure are you putting on authorities, on the government in Nigeria, indeed even on the South Africans, to get it right? No, the issue of xenophobia is truly for the politicians. The various heads of state at the AU, African Union, they all have to sit on a round table. Either they can punch themselves and decide to find a solution, or they see to talk about it, and they will come up with a solution of the issue of xenophobia. This is not for the private sector. This is not for the entrepreneurs. This is not about xenophobia. And uh, Obi, just by way of a heads up, I'm coming to you with that one. <laughs> you're you're going to take it. But this is just the pressure you're going to put on the Buhari administration, the Ramaphosa administration. You're an investor to say, you want more of my money? These are the changes I want to see. Actually, it's unusual for private sectors to insist on such demand on any government entity. It's never done that way. Uh, policy issues, the issue of uh, government regulatory issues is for the politicians. The private sector will never, actually, let me put it this way, the tail should never wag the dog. It's the dog that should wag the tail. In your next life, diplomat. <laughs> You're going to do very well. <laughs> Obi is a Kwasili. Let's talk about it. Do you think the South Africans, not the leadership, the people, have really calibrated the extent of this problem? Because I'm ashamed to say this is not the first World Economic Forum to come to South Africa with xenophobia in the backdrop. You know, there are two economies in this country, and it was never going to be sustainable. That's what we're saying. There are two economies traveling on their respective tracks and somehow never meeting. And the real challenge is that political expediency is keeping your politicians from taking the right kinds of measures that are necessary to make this economy as productive and competitive as it should be. The opportunities are incredible. There's so much to leverage on. What is it that we know grows economies and expands opportunities? We know that if you have the sound policies, you're good. We know that if you have strong institutions and regulatory systems, you're good. We know that if you invest effectively and efficiently in the public goods that re represent basic services delivery to citizens and to business, you're good. We know these three things. We know that economies that are enviable today, which used to be lower in GDP per capita compared to South Africa, 
Take a China. A China went from where it was less than a trillion dollar yeah. of GDP to 14 trillion dollars of GDP. For goodness sake, we know that just embracing the basic principles of the markets and allowing the markets to set the incentive for the business. And by the way, my dear, you should get it right now. The business elite and the political elite will be in trouble in this continent. If you want to say it's not our business to talk to the governments, huh? That's a bit of a, uh, uh, Jim, you, you've got to modify, you know, because what the continent is in need of is an, a sense of urgency. Yeah. This feeling that we have comfort and we have relative comfort and we can manage to navigate it, mm. it's not going to last for long. I'm staying with we you. all must use our voice. <laughs> we need good governance on this continent. We need good politics on this continent. Because frankly speaking, Loretta, I came to this place not to be in a normal World Economic Forum, but to sound a stridency mm. that what we are seeing in our respective countries is not going to be wished away. And we I want need to stay to with tackle. you. I want to stay with you because it's not just South Africa that's in trouble right now. Look at my country. Exactly. And in fact, there's a UN report, but it's, it's, it's a bit of an old report, but nonetheless still valid. It found that 40% of young people who had joined rebel movements, militant groups, or criminal gangs, 40% of those young recruits said they did it because they had no jobs. When you are idle, when you're unemployed, you get swayed. Yes. So how much more of a problem are we going to experience? We're going to experience much more of it until we fix it. Problems are not, problems are not, uh, what do you call it? They're not rocket science. The good thing for Africa is that we actually find examples of countries and continents that have been down our path. But what did it take to solve it? We now understand some critical factors that go together to create growth in all our conversation. I want us to take one thing away. We're not going to find band aids as solutions because they don't last. We need real structural change. Structural change of our economy, structural change, of our political landscape. And so what it means is we have to be more deliberate and intentional about what we're seeing on our streets. And we're not being that. You know what we're being? We're having good, normal situation conversations. Yeah. And that's very unhealthy because that's like playing the ostrich. Yeah. The young people that are out there are very angry. Yeah. Extremely angry. And they do not in any way differentiate between you, Loretta, me, I know. and the Bilonia Jimovia. The fact that you have any opportunity at all on the continent means that you are in trouble. So what we therefore must avert our minds to is how do we expand the opportunities? If you looked at all the sectors of comparative advantage for Africa, why is it that we have failed to take the very tough measures of the kinds of policies right. that would jumpstart they those sectors? Yeah. That's where the opportunities right. will come from. But what gets in the way? Bad politics. Right. Our politicians live for themselves. Let's call a spade a spade, not an agricultural implement. We have a problem of politics on our continent. We have a problem of bad leadership on our continent. We should not in any way hide it any further. Right. We must solve this problem ourselves. And then, uh, Karen, just a very brief contribution from you, and then I'm going to start taking questions from the floor, which is, I cannot tell you how many times I've heard the term fourth industrial revolution. Every day, every week. And sometimes you wonder, the politicians using the terminology, do they understand it? 
They know it's a sexy phrase, but do they get it? Do you get a sense that they get it? Look, I, I think there are politicians who do understand that, I mean, the, the, the phrase I would use is, the answer isn't rocket science, it's computer science in a lot of these things. I think the dedication by, that exists in many pockets in, in government in Africa that we have seen, you know, at a, at a routine level, to trying to do things to develop that skill set is, is laudable. And we, for instance, at Google have recently entered into an agreement with the government of Nigeria where we're going to be supplying curriculum to the Nigerian Ministry of Education. 56 million Nigerian students are going to get a module, a uh, Google trained module around computer science. It's not going to equip them to be, you know, uh, elite coders, but it's going to develop that, that fluency, that frequency. So I do think there are some that get it. Look, at the end of the day, um, this is going to require a partnership. I, I really do believe that. I think government has a significant role to play, and I think Obi is right. I think if, the, if, if bad policies are adopted, you're not necessarily going to see the business complain. You're going to see business leave. You're going to see business take their dollars elsewhere, take their, their euros elsewhere. But I do think that there is right now this opportunity. There's a sense of, of if we could just figure out that right path, that the combination of investment in the private sector, government engagement, could yield some spectacular things for Africa. Okay, in the interest of time, I'm going to take five comments. But here are the rules, ladies and gentlemen. We'd only like to hear from men and women in the room who have a solution to offer. And what do I mean by that? From your role, in your organization, in your country, what have you done to dent Poverty. What are you doing right now that we can actually track scientifically to say, since this was done, this is how many jobs were created? We want to hear about those experiences. So if you think that's you, please put up your hand. We want to hear from you. Yes, sir. Front row, please stand up until the microphone comes your way. Anybody else? Yes, ma'am, please stand up. The microphone will get to you. Anybody who's got a story to tell us about how you have created jobs and addressed this issue of youth despair caused by unemployment? I know there's many of you in the room. Yes, sir, and yes, sir, and madam here in the middle. Please stand up so that the microphones can get to you. Just stand, keep standing. Stand so that we know. Yes, let's go, sir. My name is uh, Kumar, K.S. Kumar, and I come from a company called uh, Sutherland. Uh, over the last 16 years, we have made about uh, 45,000 jobs in uh, uh, 15 countries uh, in the IT and able services space. Uh, the fundamental building block of how we have done it always has been uh, one of stakeholder alignment between country, community, client, and company. Uh, we've gone to countries where we meet heads of states to understand what are their priorities. And of course, the World Economic Forum has been a great opportunity. We've, we've gone and done that. Uh, and uh, we have worked with heads of states where they, they prioritize to say, this is important for us. I can say, for example, but I don't want to take too much time. And then we worked with communities in those countries with the alignment of the stakeholders, the heads of state and the communities, local governors or mayors, to build infrastructure, build technology, build, uh, you know, build the bandwidth, uh, connectivity, build the buildings, train people over a couple of years' time, and then we made jobs uh, in many countries like that. How that. many jobs? About 45,000 jobs. Thank and you. I've been struggling to find a way to do something in Africa. I've been coming for three, four years. I've been to many countries. To get that alignment with the stakeholders, I have not been able to find the solution yet, including your country, madam. I was promising to make 10,000 jobs, but we couldn't get into doing that in a country like Ethiopia or in South Africa, uh, or of course, you know, in okay. some other countries. Thank you. Thank you for sharing, and hopefully the Ethiopian delegation will get in touch with you and you can talk. <laughs> yes, ma'am. Hi, everyone. My name is Gwenda Mawoja, and I represent um, SAP Africa, SAP. Um, I run a program called SAP Next Gen, which is all about building the next generation of talent for the technology ecosystem um, across, well, I manage the program for Africa, but this is a global initiative that we run all over the world. So I just wanted to share an example from an SAP perspective how we've tried to tackle this, this matter of, of this disparity between youth skills and what is needed in the market. 
what we've done is to try and, and take an approach where we look at the entire value chain of a young person that's um, building a skill set or building a career. So we create programs that focus on um, learners, youngsters, and then we also have a program that focuses on youth um, post-18, and then we also have a program that looks at um, people that are unemployed graduates, for example, in their 20s that need to support um, families around them. The first program that we run with youth is a very broad, um, sort of, I would say maybe a low impact, high volume program where we introduce awareness around coding skills. And that's via our Africa Code Week program where we actually yesterday celebrated five years of that program and have um, over the last five years trained about five million youth across the mm. African continent. And we do that primarily by working very closely with grassroots level organizations because we realize that as SAP, we cannot be anywhere, everywhere all the time. So we leverage the networks that are already working within communities and use them to drive the solution and to, to upskill the youth. And then with the, with the youngsters, university students, we run a, a rigorous program across the continent. We've trained fewer numbers, but it's more high touch. We work with universities mm -hmm. and we empower them to teach students. Right. So I think the message is that what we do is we work through others at the grassroots level and that allows us to have right. broader reach. Just before you sit down, many young people are watching via live stream. Yes. If they wanted to get onto your program, where would they go? So they can follow at SAP Next Gen. They can find information there on Twitter. So we're on all the social platforms. At Africa Code Week is a good platform as well as at SAP Africa. Thank you very much. Yes, sir. Thank you. My name is Chinedu Azodo and I'm the Chief Growth Officer at a company called Max Okada out of Lagos, Nigeria. Um, we have about 1,600 direct employees um, that we've been able to roll out. What we do is build out the technology and finance infrastructure to enable mobility for two and three wheelers um, in Nigeria today, uh, West African region over the next 12 months. Um, we've raised about $8 million in funding and have taking the average motorcycle tax, taxi um, income in Lagos from th um, about $83 um, a month when we first started to between six and $800 a month right now. What we do is we, we've looked at the, the value chain and figured out what the issues with motorcycle taxis are. <coughs> Most of these drivers never get to own their own motorcycle taxis because the cost of purchasing them is exorbitantly, exorbitantly high initially. So what we've done is to build out a very detailed background check process where we randomly bring in these drivers, do run psychometric tests on them, figure out who has the right psychometric profile to actually work in this kind of business in Nigeria, um, do a lot of work for them around streamlining what they do, provide a lot of training for them. So in a space of about two weeks, these guys go through a rigorous training program on our platform. Um, and after that, they, we essentially give them motorcycles. Um, part of what we've done is to essentially bring, is to also bring in funders. So we work with a couple microfinance banks in Nigeria. We work with a couple. Um, we have um, crowd funders who have put money in on the platform, and we take money from these people, lend it to these drivers at about 40% per annum. The average driver is able to purchase motorcycles with a lease of um, outside max in Nigeria. It pays about 100 to 150% per annum in okay. interest rates. Um, so the, or they don't actually get any access at all, depending on where they go. So what we've been able to do is to crash significantly what these prices these drivers are paying is, and then provide the technology for them to be able to essentially run ride hailing. So to the average consumer, we're a motor taxi hailing business, but for these drivers, we're an entire educational system built around um, the success of these drivers. So we track them from before they join the platform, work with them throughout, provide um, education in terms of how to read and ride properly, right. how to ride, and essentially how to make more money. Thank you very much. You see Mr. Ovia? You should come and talk with him also. That's the plan. That's the plan. In fact, I have, yes, I have Mbele, I have financing for him. He should see me after a double digit. It's done. Yes, ma'am. Yes, my name is Megan Falone, and I'm the director of the Barefoot College International, an organization that works to bring into the formal economy uh, young people as well as women primarily in rural areas where they have not had access to a formal education. And I think this conversation is um, not complete because we continue to discuss the pathways to work as a silver bullet for people who can read and write. Instead of really talking about the investment that must be made in our rural populations in Africa in order to enable them to be both entrepreneurial, full of confidence, competence, and self-belief, able to create self-sustaining 
and vibrant rural communities. And I think that this definition, the same way the definition of education needs to begin to widen to include many different pathways to, uh, to joining a formal economy, this conversation about work also needs to widen. Thank I you. see thousands of young people who feel they are not able to join simply because they haven't had access to learning. Thank you. Yes, sir. Yeah. Hi, um, my name is KK Fumba. I am from Refinitiv, um, the director of Africa Accounts. Um, Refinitiv is formerly known as Thomson Reuters. So, talking to policy, um, the one thing that we take advantage of, particularly in the South African context, is the triple BEE, right? Where we are taking advantage of that because for the nature of the business that we do, we don't necessarily have to conform to BE in South Africa. I mean, we see it with our competitors and that kind of thing. But we have insisted in South Africa that we have to comply to BE codes because we want to do business and, of course, do well. Of course, the numbers that we're talking about, they are not as enormous as the 40,000 jobs that want to be created, that, that, that the other firms are creating. We're talking about 20, 30 graduates that we take from previously disadvantaged communities. But it's a small little ways, because I think the other part of the problem is that for youth particularly, is that we are always looking at big scale impact and so on, mm -hmm. and, and forgetting that even the one or two graduates or, or just any youth that you take in that small numbers, will have a bigger impact in the long run. So, yeah, I mean, that's the only small way that right. we are doing it in the context of South Africa. It's never small. One job created is and a no good much. job created. Yeah. Thank you very much. All right, so let's wrap up our panel. We've got slightly less than five minutes. Your Excellency, sir, one of the things we really didn't delve into is education and how we are preparing the youth for the promise of the future. So from your perspective, what are the immediate interventions needed? Well, you know, we need to get into a very intense, holistic uh, review of curricula. And we need to do that with a full understanding that the very curricula we're reviewing is going to be, is probably going to be irrelevant in a few years' time. And therefore, you need to have it designed in such a manner that it can continuously change and allow for newer skill sets newer knowledge bases to be absorbed. And finally, I think it's important that we understand from the very word go that we need to invest differently. We need to put our money where it matters the most. President Zude? Yes, I, I, I think this is what we should be doing. In Ethiopia, we are, we are reviewing the curriculum. We have a new roadmap on, on education, which is under discussion. We have challenges around it, uh, but uh, nevertheless, this is what uh, we should be doing. And uh, w w as I have said, uh, the, the, the education we give should be really matching the need of, of, of the country. I don't think we need many PhDs and so on. We have amazing young Ethiopians, and I refer to a woman who is involved in this artificial intelligence, but she started at the age of nine. I don't know why she should be going until PhD. What she, so we have to review the whole thing, and it has to match the need of, of the country. This is what we are, we are doing currently. Jim Ovia, the skills that you think would benefit young people going forward? I think the question is skill. Many of the young people have education. They're already educated already. What they do lack is the skill to perform certain specific tasks. They needed to have those skills. How do they acquire the skills? By creating additional vocational schools, either in the area of ICT, or in the area of agriculture, or in the area of manufacturing, or in area of petrochemical, but they don't know these things. These are the various areas that will create jobs for the youth, and they themselves will be creators of jobs, innovators, makers, builders, and also employers. They needed to be employers as opposed to uh, looking for jobs. Well, we need to prepare them to be able to create jobs themselves, as the Chinese saying, if you give one fish to eat, you feed him for one day. Yeah. 
But if you teach him how to fish, he is going to be for life an employer and he will feed himself for life. Yeah. That's what we need to do. Obuza Kwasili, <laughs> I think I need to say you're a former minister of education. So policy-wise, what needs to change? What needs to change is um, we need to render the very anachronistic ministries of education redundant. Um, a lot of what's going on is showing us that once you give a child basic literacy, education is now totally differently defined for the 21st century. And we need to upgrade our mindset to that. So change entirely, overhaul the education ministries across the continent. Take away these people who are still tied to the old ideas of the British education system, which they believe they are guardian angels for. We must overhaul that. Number two is we need to actually look at each of the sectors from where our opportunities can come and look at what it is that would make those sectors productive and competitive and, and then invest our policies and our institutions and our investment into them. And then number three, we need to get this conversation around the social contract between the leaders, the political leadership of this continent and the citizens, because we are operating a broken social contract. And that's why instead of there being a conversation, we have conflict right. and friction, and it's time to change that. And finally, Karen Bhatia, we're told in the future driverless cars will be putting our monies in ledgers called blockchain. Our cities will be run through artificial intelligence. Our farming will be done in the same way. So what do we all need to be able to do to function? I think we first of all need to be excited about the future because there's <laughs> tremendous opportunity out there, including through the continent. Um, the second thing, just on the education point, Look, we're going to continue to need a diversity of subject matter experts in Africa as elsewhere around the world. But the one thing I will say is all of those sectors are going to be digitally enabled. So there has to be some level of digital literacy. And the last thing I would say is we need to emphasize girls and women's education as much as, as men's. And one of the things I'm very proud about at Google, we announced a, a uh, objective to educate 10 million uh, uh, children, kids on, in Africa, digital education, with a 50% target being women and girls. So I, I think that needs to be something we're all focused on. Thank you very much. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in thanking Karan Bhatia, Obeza Kwesili, Jim Ovia, President Zude, and President Musisi, Botswana and Ethiopia. Thank you for your time. Thank you.